Hello, wonderful educators. My name is Nicole Piper, and I will be hosting this session today on best practices for virtual teaching. Uh, this session is also a live webinar. If you get the chance to attend the live webinar, I highly, highly suggest that you do, just because in that session, you'll get to see more of the pacing with an actual live audience um, and get to see me model the practices with real students. Um, the reason I'm recording this session instead of uh, just recording the live one is because those live ones have a very large number of people in them for the, so the chat gets really, really busy. And I didn't want you guys to be overwhelmed with that when you're trying to focus on the actual lesson uh, that I'm presented. But if you can come to the webinar, I would really, really love to see you there. It does add um, some extra experience as well. I'm going to go ahead and turn off my video because I personally prefer not to use video uh, during my lessons. I find it distracting. That one's just a personal preference on what you'll like to do and you'll figure it out with your uh, individual students and also probably with your administration as well. Before we get started, I want to give you a really quick overview of what this session is. Uh, it is a very, very basic overview of the different elements of a successful live online class with lots of modeling. It should be appropriate for all grade levels, um, but you are going to have to adjust things for your grade level if you're a kindergarten teacher or if you are um, teaching AP history. Obviously, things are going to look different, but this basic skeleton is going to be the same. What this session is not, it is not a tutorial for how to actually use any features or functions of a live teaching program. The program I'm using right now is called Blackboard Collaborate. I could teach you how to use Blackboard Collaborate, but I don't know if that's the program that your district and your union are going to agree for you to use with your students. Therefore, that's not what we're going to be doing today. Other common platforms include Zoom, which you may have experience with already. This is also not uh, a how-to on asynchronous uh, distance learning. So anything that students are working on on their own independently, this is not a tutorial for that. This is just for live learning. At the end of the day today, I don't expect you to be able to go and create your own live class, like boom, here you go. Um, but I do want to just give you an idea of what it might look like and get your brain starting to think about um, how a lesson might go. And it's also my hope that you will see that it's really not that different from planning class, uh, from planning a lesson in your regular brick and mortar classes. So let's get rolling. The very first step to, for me to create a successful virtual lesson is I want to have something that I call bell work. We know bell work in our brick and mortar is when students are coming in, they're putting away their backpacks, they're taking out their notebooks. This is the online version of that. The first best practice is to make sure that we give students plenty of time to log in. If you have agreed that your session is going to start at 1030, you probably want to give students until about 10. 35 to log in just because sometimes stuff takes a little while. Uh, sometimes they might have to reboot their computer and come back in. In my experience, it's easier to have everybody start at the same time at 1035 than it is to uh, have people trickling in at different times and having to keep explaining yourself. And I'll show you what the bell work screen looks like so you can see why students aren't bored during that time. One thing you might want to put on your bell work screen are some tech tasks. You're going to see on this next screen the tech tasks I put up for the live webinar were that I asked teachers to make sure they were muted and to make sure that their cameras were off and that their participants and chat box were open. For your students, you may want them to check their microphones to make sure they're working. You may even want to have them go grab their, uh, their notebook, uh, a ruler, a piece of paper. Depending on what you're doing that day, you want to have them grabbing that stuff while we're getting ready for class. I also love to have an activity for students who get in early. Uh, I, I like to have something fun here, a search, a brain teaser, riddle, joke, funny picture, a meme, something fun. You could start with vocabulary or with a math problem, um, but I like for this just to kind of get everybody in and engage on something fun because we're going to do lesson stuff later. Here's an example of a bell work slide. This is the one that I use for the actual live webinar version of this session. Uh, it welcomes everyone, it tells them where they are, tells us when we're going to get started so they know when that's going to get going. I've got some tech tasks here that I asked our teachers to do in that webinar. And then I have a fun little thing here. We're searching for the bunny that doesn't have a twin. It's actually harder than it looks. Usually, 
everybody would be logging in. We'll pretend it's about four o'clock right now. Everybody would be logging in and I would have a timer up at the top of the screen counting down the time until class starts. Uh, not online platform, all online platforms have timers. Blackboard Collaborate happens to. I like using a timer for many reasons. Uh, the biggest one is it keeps you on track, but it also helps the students know when they're expected to have something done. So you don't get those questions all the time in the chat. When are we starting? When are we starting? What are we doing? Boom, there's the timer you know when it's happening. And there's the bunny, by the way, if you were able to find the one that didn't have a twin. Alrighty, the second step to creating an online virtual lesson, we just did our bell work. Everybody hopefully is in and kind of situated. And the next step is we're going to show our norms and our rules. You're probably, depending on the age of your students, going to want to do this every class for a while because they're just getting used to online class too. It's going to depend on your group of students as well. You know, if you have a rowdier bunch, you might need to go over this more. If you have a more calm bunch, you might not need to do it as much. Uh, when you put your norms and rules up on the screen, make sure you get the affirmative from students that those are nor norms and rules they can agree to. Uh, that way, if they're acting up later, you can go, hey, you remember you agreed to those norms and rules at the beginning? What happened to that? Here's an example of my actual norms and rules slide that I actually use for my students. It's called the Adventures Agreement here because our theme this year is Adventure Time. Um, I have some things that I'm most concerned with on this list here that students try their hardest at all times by participating, that it's better to say I don't know than not answer at all. Uh, that you keep personal information private, respect their fellow learners, treating virtual setting as a classroom. Your rules and norms are going to be different depending on your the age of your students and what you're trying to get. Uh, I added this one for the live version of this webinar, which was the norm that teachers only ask questions about a specific slide, save general questions for later. Normally what I do with my students is I will actually have them uh, put their initials on this page if they think they can agree to these. And I can save this page so that if they're ever uh, not uh, following our rules and norms, I can always bring up the page and say, hey, you remember you signed that and we can talk about it. You can also just have them give a green check or a, an affirmative why in the chat box, whatever works for you. So we've done our bell work, everybody's in, we've gone over our norms and rules. The next step that I like to include in all of my virtual lessons is some connection time. You are so lucky that you actually know your students in person and they know each other. Um, that's such a huge advantage to you. I really want you to keep that connection that you've worked so hard to build all year. Um, so you really have to carve out that time. I think your students are going to find this really, really incredibly valuable. This is a good time to share something about you. This is where you can put a picture of your funny slippers you're wearing, uh, what you ate for breakfast. Just talk about your day. Let them chat with each other and talk about how their lives are going and what's going on with them. Have students share something. Maybe they've been working on an art project uh, while we've been in our strange kind of off state. Uh, maybe they they uh, made a new video for TikTok that they want to share with their friends. Let them share. Another good idea is to have some kind of celebration or congratulations page. Uh, this is this would be probably best reserved for things like, hey, this student completed all their work today and or this week and sent it to me or today, depending on your situation, and sent it to me. Let's celebrate this person. Hey, this person did an awesome job with chapter three. Let's celebrate this person. It's somebody's birthday. Those things that you guys celebrate in your regular brick and mortar class, you're going to want to celebrate here. You can probably think of lots and lots of other things. Uh, here's an example of a slide that I show my students when they're first getting to know me. Uh, my students do not meet me in person before I get them, so I really have to work to kind of get to know them, have them get to know me. I put some pictures of some things that I like. I added some things for you guys. Uh, this is my eighth year teaching online. I have been a new teacher trainer as well for virtual teaching. I teach middle school language arts uh, intervention online. This is an example of a congratulations page or a celebration page. As you can tell, it is not complicated. It is extremely, extremely simple. And you'd be shocked at how much uh, everybody of all ages loves to see their name on a screen. If one of your students did something really amazing and you put their name up here, they are gonna lose their minds and be so, so happy and proud. Everybody loves this. And this is also a great way to encourage on that independent or asynchronous work because they know they're gonna get recognized for it later. 
So we've done our bell work. Everybody's come in. We've set up our new norms and rules. We've took, taken some time to make that content connection, or for you guys, it's maintaining that connection, right? The next thing we want to do is we want to go over our learning target. This is exactly the same as you do in your brick and mortar classroom when you have your standard or your objective up on the whiteboard. It's, it's literally exactly that. So this is something you do already. You just got to make a, a slide for it. Uh, you can also use this time to put up the agenda for the day. Uh, that's going to depend on probably the age of your students and how many activities you have going on for the day. I don't usually do that too much, but I can see how it would be practical in some situations. Of course, we want our objective or our target to be in student friendly language, whatever age your students are, just like you do in your, your regular classroom. I like an I can statement personally for my objectives, uh, but if you do as students will be able to, that'll work just fine here too. Here's an example of today's agenda. Today I'm going to teach you how to create a successful virtual lesson with these seven steps. And here's an example of a target slide. This is an actual target slide that I use with my students. I got a little target on there. Why not? Uh, my fellow middle school uh, language arts teachers will recognize this standard, Literacy 6.1. Uh, I can refer to the text to support my thoughts and draw inferences about a piece of informational text. That's a real standard that I work with uh, with my students all the time. Our target for today with uh, you guys and myself is I would like you guys to feel more comfortable with the idea of planning and hosting an online class. I know you're not going to be able to go do it right away after this. I just want you to kind of get a feeling, an inkling, a thought, just a little bit more comfort knowing that you can do it because it is really not that different than what you do already. You guys are teachers. You are professionals. You're good at this. You're going you're gonna to be able to do it. We've done our bell work. We've set up our nose and rules. We've taken some time to make a connection. We have just uh, identified our learning target for the day. Now we actually get into the good stuff, which is the lesson type stuff. I always like to start with a warm up, which probably most of you do as well in your brick and mortar classes. A warm up can be anything uh, that you want to do to get their brains started on that uh, more educational academic path. Uh, some good ideas include a review from last class a preview for this class, maybe a vocabulary question or task. Uh, maybe for my math folks, you're going to have them solve a problem. Uh, it can also be a tell me what you know about this topic or this thing. Give me your thoughts about this topic or this thing. Let's practice this skill that I know you guys already have. You're going to be able to think of other things that fit your individual topic and grade level as well for this. My little note here, I'm going to say this a lot of times today uh, because I think it's really, really important. I'm sorry, I'm going to sound like a broken record. Please make sure you give appropriate wait time for these tasks. You know your students. You know how long it takes them to do a task. Uh, you know how long it takes your students to write a paragraph. You know how long it takes your students to solve a slope. You know how long it takes your students to draw the letter S, right? Please make sure you give them the appropriate amount of time for this. This is the warm up that I used with our teachers in the live version of this webinar. Our warm up was in the chat. Please tell me how long you have been teaching and what is your experience with virtual teaching? I gave them the option to just put the letter because I wanted this to be a quick warm up. This one would be like a one minute warm up. Usually with my students, my middle schoolers, I usually give a three to five minute warm up depending on what I'm asking them to do. Um, it's going to change based on your topic and your grade level. So we've done our bell work. We've set up our norms and rules. We've taken some time to make a connection. We know our learning target. We're nice and warmed up. Now it's lesson time. Uh, my personal favorite lesson order, lesson style, is the classic I do, we do, you do that you're probably familiar with from your brick and mortar classroom. We know we want our I do to be short. We know we want our we do to be a little longer and our you do to be ideally the longest. That's always the goal, right? As we're gradually releasing our responsibility. Uh, a big note here is students should have something to do every couple minutes, every two to five minutes, depending on the age of your students, whether that's just giving a green check or a smiley face, uh, whether that's answering in chat or speaking on the mic or getting on the camera, students should be doing something every few minutes. Again, like I said, I'm going to be telling you this a lot. Please give appropriate wait time for whatever activity you ask. Don't expect your kids to be reading an entire page of text in a minute. 
that's obviously not going to happen. And you know how long it takes your kids. The wait time might feel a little funny at first because you might feel like you're just sitting there at the computer staring at it, like not knowing what they're doing. You'll get used to it, I promise. They need that wait time. They are still working for you, I promise. Well, they're working for themselves, but they're working on what you've asked them to do. The I do section of your lesson, just like in your regular classroom, is going to be your quote unquote lecture time. I use little quotey quotes there because I really don't want you lecturing too much. Um, obviously, this is going to be different if you are an AP psychology teacher. You know you can get away with about 20 minutes of lecturing to your students and they're going to be able to attend that long. Obviously, if you're a third grade teacher, you're probably only going to want to talk for about three minutes maximum before they're going to start to lose focus. You know how long your students can pay attention. You work with them every day. A, power, a PowerPoint is fine here. If you have PowerPoints that you use in your classroom already, this will work. Those will work A-OK -okay here as well. All you got to do is build in opportunities for your students to interact with you while you're doing this PowerPoint. Obviously, nobody wants to sit there and listen to someone read a PowerPoint for 20 minutes, which I'm doing to you. I'm sorry. Uh, some tips for having students interact with you are have the students read on the microphone have them popcorn read, have them point to something on the screen. You might want to give them instructions that they should be taking notes on this slide. Uh, one of my coworkers, uh, Amy Graza, does this wonderful thing where when she wants her students to take notes on a slide, she will make sure to mark it in some way. For example, I just put that little red star at the top there. Um, if she wants her students to take notes on a page, she'll make sure to mark it so they know, oh, I'm supposed to take notes on this screen right here. Obviously, that works better for older students. You can also do kind of a simple are you there question. Uh, hey, uh, give me a green check if you understand what we talked about on this page. Just something to know that they are still there, that they have not left you to go play Call of Duty or eat a sandwich, and that they're following where we're going. A little note to keep in mind, studies show that most people tune out of an online lecture after about six minutes, and that is for grown adults. So we want to make sure we're building in lots and lots of opportunities for them to interact with you and each other um, so they stay with us. The we do, of course, is going to be a little bit longer, just like in your brick and mortar class. This is where they're going to practice whatever skill you just taught them with your guidance. There's a lot of ways that this could happen. Maybe they answer in the chat box. Maybe they write on the board. Maybe they guide you through solving the problem or answering the question. Maybe they work with a partner or a small group. Maybe they use their mic or camera. I could explain to you how all of these things work. So if you're sitting there in your head going, all right, cool, Nicole, that's great. I don't know how to do any of those things. That's OK. <laughs> those things we can teach you once you know what platform you're on. I just want you to have in your head that there's lots and lots of ways for this to happen. You're going to find what works best for you. Uh, another uh, this note again, I told you I was going to keep saying it. Please, please give appropriate work and think time. Um, they need, if you want them to actually do the work that you're asking them to do, you have to give them enough time to do that. Uh, it's not fair to say, hey, everybody, tell me the main idea of this section. Wait two seconds and they go, okay, so the main idea of this section is nobody can type that fast. Nobody can think that fast. We want to make sure we give them the actual time. It's going to feel funny because you're sitting by yourself and you're staring at a screen, but I promise, promise they need it. Last step is, of course, the you do. This is obviously ideally the longest step. We want our students doing uh, the bulk of the work. Uh, this is where students are going to practice whatever skill that, you, that you've taught them on their own. You might decide to dismiss them for this. Uh, this might be the point where you switch from synchronous live instruction to asynchronous instruction, where you send them off to their book, where you send them off to their Google Classrooms to work on this on their own. That's going to depend on your situation. You may choose to use breakout rooms for them to work on things. You may have them answer in the chat. You may have them work on a piece of paper and scan it and send it to you. Uh, you may have them work while you're watching them in their Google Classrooms or some other um, program that allows you to see their work live. This is really going to depend on your class, uh, once again, your grade level, and what you're going for that day. Please see the virtual teacher guide that I'm going to send to you at the end of this uh, recording. It has tons and tons of resources uh, for different tools uh, that you can use for these activities. 
Also, it's got tons of resources, places you can find lessons, warm-ups, activities, games. It's got a ton of stuff on there. Um, so keep an eye out for that at the end. Right here, I put an example of a slide that I actually use with my students. I'm going to show it to you how I actually give it to my students once we start reading it. I'm going to adjust this a little here. And I asked this question to my webinar participants uh, when we did this live. I asked in the chat, can you please tell me what do you notice about this slide? So I'd like you to take a few seconds here. I'll, I'll model using the timer for you. I'd like you to take a few seconds and just think about what things do you notice on this slide? Alrighty, our timer's up. <laughs> so hopefully you're thinking about the things that you notice on this slide. Uh, I asked, as you see, the teachers to tell me what they noticed in the chat. I assured them that they cannot hurt my feelings because I'm a middle school teacher. Uh, and the biggest comment that I got on this slide with that is that it is boring. Um, which is what I was actually going for. So don't worry, my feelings weren't hurt by that. Um, I wanted to talk to you about this because I know that teachers are just like so creative and there are so many of us that are very um, visual and they love to decorate and make things beautiful and pretty and cute and clip art and borders and backgrounds and colors, especially my elementary school teachers. Y'all are so wonderful and creative and fantastic. A big difference between uh, in-person learning and virtual learning is that everything that you want the student to attend to for the most part is on this screen. If my goal for the day is to have my students read this passage about reptiles, having Snoopy in the corner, having a little bit moji of me in the other corner telling them good job, having a bunch of squiggles and backgrounds and colors is not going to help them read this page. I really, really encourage you all to be very, very thoughtful and very, very intentional about what you put on your actual lesson slides. If the picture does not serve the lesson, the objective of that day, don't put it on there. If the background does not serve the lesson or the objective of that day, don't put it on there. I prefer to call this slide, it's, it's, a, it's a clean slide. It's a clean slide. It's easy to look at. There's no distractions. Here, we'll make it blue so it feels clean. It's a nice clean slide. Keep in mind that your, uh, your advanced learners will read anything on any page you put it on or will solve any equation on any page you put it on, right? You can put all kinds of things on it. Your advanced learners will still do it. We really, really have to be mindful of our struggling learners, uh, our kids who have uh, visual processing disorders or maybe ADD. Those little clip arts and pretty little backgrounds are going to be extremely distracting to those students of ours. I even find it distracting and I don't have any of those things. Um, so please, please for me, keep your, your slides nice and empty. Give them room to think which is really what we're going for. No student ever came to a class because they're like, oh, I really, really like Miss Piper's PowerPoint. So that's why I always go to her class. No, no one cares. Sorry, I shouldn't say no one cares. There are some great, cute, adorable, wonderful PowerPoints, but the most engaging thing on earth is learning something new. So we really, 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 really want to give space for that to happen. So I encourage you to think about that. Another thing that a lot of teachers commented on this slide is that it was a lot of text. That is absolutely true. Remember, I teach middle school students, so it may be more than you're used to with your younger students. This is not a PowerPoint. 
if this were a PowerPoint and I were trying to teach um, and I were trying to teach a skill, yeah, this slide would have way too much text. But I'm not. This is actually our reading for the day. So this is like the pop open your textbook and let's read page 25 situation. So it's going to look different than a regular PowerPoint. I just wanted to make that note because I saw a lot of uh, teachers comment on that and it made sense to me why they were thinking that. So the takeaway from this is please do not confuse cute for engaging. Cute is not always engaging. Sometimes it can be distracting. Keep an eye out for that. Be very, very critical. Uh, but my wonderful, beautiful, creative, fantastic teachers who love cute stuff, save that cute stuff for the community building slides. That's where you get to go crazy with the bitmojis and the pictures and the, the clip art and the fun stuff. Use that. Save it for the time when it makes sense. Every single thing that you put on a lesson slide should have a job. It should serve a purpose. For example, I wanted to, uh, actually I added this from the live webinar because I wanted to give an example of how visual can be, uh, can serve your lesson. If we uh, were reading that article about reptiles and we wanna pr practice the skill of comparing and contrasting, I could totally put up a picture of a crocodile and an alligator side by side, and then we can have a whole conversation about the, the differences and the similarities between crocodiles and alligators. That is an image that is serving my objective for that day, so it is there. Take advantage of that stuff. If you have a video that serves your objective for that day, use that video. Not too much, though. If you have a game that serves your objective for that day, use that game. Not too much, though. Uh, the kids come to be educated by you. They want to be with their teacher and they want to learn from their teacher, they don't They don't want to watch a video and play a game for 30 minutes. They, they do that plenty on their own, trust me. So visuals, games, uh, videos, music, all of that stuff is super useful if you are very careful with it. Uh, here's an example of an actual work slide that I have my students work on. Um, this, these are just questions that we're going to answer. For the we do, we're going to answer some of these questions together. For the you do, they're going to answer some of these questions on their own. Uh, a capability that many online classrooms, online teaching platforms have is you can actually cover stuff up like I'm doing right now. And I am, I do this, <laughs> I do this always because I don't like people reading, uh, trying to focus on things we're not trying to focus on. So I will actually cover things that we are not looking at at that moment so that we are all absolutely focused on this one question here. You may also know this trick for our students who have a hard time reading a line of text. You, you know, we did it with a piece of paper and you held it up to the line, right? Same thing. We can do it on, on this virtual setting too. Pretty much anything you can do in your live class, you can do here. Alrighty, so we've done our bell work, we've set up our norms and rules, we've taken some time to make connection, we know our learning target, we've warmed up our brains, we've done a lesson with an I do, we do, you do. The last step to end our day is going to be an exit ticket. Uh, as I admitted in the, in the live webinar, this is not my personal strongest suit. Uh, I always end up getting in conversations with my students and then I end up running out of time. Don't be like me, have an exit <laughs> ticket. I always have it there, we just don't always get to it. It is acceptable to use whatever the last question you're working on is as your exit ticket, but it's 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 better practice to have an actual exit ticket. We usually want to have some kind of wrap up from class. We don't want to just go, oh, it's it's three o'clock, time to go, right? Um, a lot of times it's going to be a question they have to answer to leave uh, or an equation they have to solve to leave. Uh, generally, I don't let them go until they actually answer or solve that, and I will bother them until they answer or solve it. Um, it could also be, a, what did you learn today, kind of like our KWL charts. We could have a, what did you learn today, or how do you feel about what you learned today? That's acceptable, too. I have uh, teacher friends who also use like a fun riddle or a joke here if you want to end on kind of a lighter note. Uh, you can also use this slide to give further instructions for independent time for asynchronous learning and that makes sense to me too. A fun bonus is a little 7.5. If you have students who miss the class and watch the recording, you send them the recording, correct? Uh, a good way to see if they actually watch the recording, because they'll say to you, oh, yes, Miss Piper, I absolutely watched the recording. You go, okay, so what was the exit ticket? Obviously, if they don't know the answer to the exit ticket, they probably did not watch the whole recording. So it's a nice little accountability piece, too. The exit ticket um, is, is productive, and it is helpful. 
So here is the exit ticket that I used with the live version of this webinar. I assured the teachers, don't worry, I'm not going to kick you out after you answer it. I had them in the chat tell me one thing they learned today that they're going to use in their virtual classes. I highly encourage you to think about that as well. Something you learned today that you're like, oh yeah, I could see myself applying it. I hope you noticed that the arrangement of the lesson is not very different from what you do every single day. Actually, I'd like to review that before we before we completely finish up. Um, these steps, these seven steps here, like I said, I'm my my sincere hope is that you see that it's not different from what you do, and I'm hoping that you can imagine how the resources you use in your classroom, uh, your PowerPoints, even your your uh, worksheets could possibly be applied in this setting. I'm not going to tell you right now how to do those things. Once again, not until people start to find out what learning platform they're going to be using, because I want to give you good relevant advice. I don't want to teach you how to use a whole program that you're never going to use, but that these steps, these ideas, these this kind of progression of the lesson is going to be true of any live session that you're teaching at any time. Some teachers ask me, well, how do I know if I'm going to be teaching a live session? How many live sessions am I going to be teaching? How many kids are going to be in my live session? That's the time where you really, really, really need to talk to your uh, your union president and to CTA. They're going to be the ones that help you with uh, making sure that you have your district is offering you the proper, proper training. They're giving you the tools that you need to be successful. Uh, those are not questions that I can answer. Those are things you need to work with your union on. Alrighty. So this is the part where I ask teachers to ask me questions. Um, you guys are obviously asynchronous for me, so you can't do that with me live, but I do have a survey for this session. Once again, I highly recommend you come to the live session if you can, just to get a feeling for the pacing of it. Um, please, if you'd like to fill out this survey, this is a good place for you to put any questions that you still have on this topic and also tell me what questions you have that you'd like to be addressed in future webinars. Uh, please do that. I don't have a way to link this to you right now. It's a pretty easy, tiny URL. You can just type it into your, um, into your search bar and it'll pop up for you. Then I also have the link for the web, a website that we've been creating, we meaning uh, my virtual colleagues and I, have been creating for you guys for resources. Um, on that, in that website, we have a description of this webinar. You may have found this recording on that, uh, on, in that website. We also have a virtual teacher guide, which I highly, highly, highly encourage you to look at. It is full of tips and tricks on communication, technology, live sessions, asynchronous tips. Um, we've got a section there for our wonderful uh, K2 teachers who are wondering, oh my gosh, how do I do that with my younger students? And then we have a big old list of resources uh, broken down by subject mostly, but you'll be able to see by the descriptions of them if they'll be if they could be applicable to you. So we've got a ton of stuff on there. I highly, highly, highly recommend that you check this out. If you have a hard time accessing either of the, those links, you can always email me at Nicole S. Piper at gmail.com. Uh, please remember that I am always a virtual teacher, so my schedule is still uh, my usual schedule. I'm still seeing all of my kids um, and teaching a full week, so I may not be getting back to you right away, uh, but I will try to get back to you. We're also planning to release an FAQ to go along with this webinar of questions that I've been getting on the survey that keep popping up that I see a lot of teachers are concerned about. Alrighty, my wonderful educators, thank you so, 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 so much for coming to this uh, recording. If you came to the webinar, thank you. If you're going to come to the webinar in the future, uh, thank you in advance. I hope this was helpful to you. I hope it wasn't too overwhelming. Like I said, I really hope that you got to see that teaching online is really not that different from teaching in brick and mortar. It's just a different platform. You guys are professional educators. You are the best at what you do. It's just learning a new context. You could teach kids if you were stuck on a deserted island. I know you can teach kids online. I know you can do it. So what I'm going to do for the next couple seconds is I'm going to leave this screen up so that you can, uh, if you need to look back at those um, links there, you can go back and type them in if I went too quickly for you before. I'll probably leave it up for you for about a minute and then I'm going to end this recording. Thank you so much. I hope you have a wonderful day. I hope you and your families are well um, and hopefully I will see you in future webinars.